Hi, I'm Mr. Loomis. Welcome back for our fourth and final lesson of this unit. We've talked a lot in this unit about the reformers of the Gilded Age, the muckraking writers, the populists, progressives, and members of the social gospel movement. But there's one hugely important reform that we've left out so far, and we're going to tell that story today. This is the story of the women of the Gilded Age and how they won the right to vote. Before we jump in, let's preview our topics. We're going to start off by thinking about the way people back in the 1800s thought about the differences between men and women. And one woman who challenged those ideas by promoting an idea she called free love. Then we'll learn about the first woman who wanted birth control to be legal. We'll mention a Supreme Court case that helps us understand how people back then thought about women who wanted to work and what people of the Gilded Age thought the most important thing women could do really was. And finally, we'll get to the story of the 19th Amendment, which finally gave women the right to vote. Let's get started. The 1800s are often called the Victorian Age, named after Queen Victoria of Great Britain, who was queen from 1837 to 1901. The time was one of conservative social values, especially for women. The social rules in America were similar to the rules in Europe, and people in both places thought that men and women should have different jobs in life. The male sphere included paid work outside the home and politics, while the female sphere was all the things done inside the home, like cleaning, cooking, and raising children. In the United States, historians called this idea the cult of domesticity. Industrialization and urbanization challenged Victorian ideas. Men got tired of working long hours and wanted to enjoy some of the new chances to relax that were becoming popular. More women were going to school, but after graduation, they found that there was almost no place that would hire them. Also, many immigrants had never learned about the old Victorian way of thinking about men and women. The leaders of this new change were the young, single, middle-class women who worked in the cities. People were starting to think differently, but almost no one was brave enough to talk about it. Almost no one except Victoria Woodhull. In 1871, she said that she had the right to love whoever she wanted. She called this free love. Woodhull's support for free love probably started after she found out that her first husband was cheating. Women who got married in the United States during the 1800s were stuck. Divorce was usually illegal, and women who could get divorced were social outcasts. Victoria Woodhull decided that women should have the choice to leave unhappy marriages. Woodhull thought that monogamous relationships were best, but she also said that she had the right to change her mind. In her view, the choice to have sex or not was, in every case, the woman's choice, since this would make her equal to the man. Woodhall said of free love, yes, I am a free lover. I have an inalienable constitutional and natural right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. With that right, neither you nor any law you can frame have any right to interfere. To be sure, not everyone agreed. Woodhall was angry that many people put up with men who had affairs when they were married, but she uh, said was wrong, uh, but that they said she was wrong for believing in free love. In 1872, Woodhall attacked a popular minister, Henry Ward Beecher. Beecher had an affair with one of the women who attended his church, and the scandal was written about in the country's newspapers. But in the end, Woodhall was put on trial for attacking Beecher in her writings. Woodhall didn't like it that men controlled everything in politics, so she ran for president in 1872. She was the first American woman to do so, and it was in a time before women could even vote. Since she was already famous for criticizing Beecher and being put on trial, the newspapers wrote a lot about her run for president. Woodhall might have made a big splash in the newspapers, but it would be many years before her ideas became popular with more than just a few people. In the Gilded Age, divorce, free love, and women presidents were just too radical. 
For many women reformers of the Gilded Age, something else was more important. Legalizing birth control or contraception. The fact that women can get pregnant, but men cannot, is one of the ways that two women, the two genders will always be unequal. And for some women of the Gilded Age, giving women the power to choose if they were going to be pregnant or not was a main way they thought women could get equal rights to men. In the 1800s, contraception was often under attack from church groups. These anti-contraception groups thought birth control was wrong and that it would lead to prostitution and venereal disease. Anthony Comstock, a postal inspector and leader of the anti-contraception movement, got Congress to pass the Comstock Act in 1873. This law made it illegal to mail anything that helped someone with birth control or abortion, or even to send information about birth control. After the Comstock law was passed, women who supported birth control had to be secretive about their work. Drugstores still sold condoms and cervical caps, but called them rubber goods and womb supporters. By 1900, a group of women decided it was time to get rid of the Comstock Act and laws like it that made talking about contraception illegal. Many of these women lived near one another in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City, and the most influential was Margaret Sanger. In 1913, Sanger was working with poor women who had severe medical problems that were the result of giving birth and being pregnant often. Some of the women Sanger worked with also had medical problems from abortions they had tried to do themselves. Sanger decided that the Comstock Acts were wrong because they limited her freedom of speech. In 1914, she started The Woman Rebel, an eight-page monthly newspaper that promoted contraception using the slogan, No Gods, No Masters. Sanger said that each woman should be in control of her own body. She is the one who came up with the term birth control, which was first used in her newsletter. Sanger's goal of challenging the Comstock Law finally happened in August 1914, when she was put on trial. However, the government lawyers focused on articles Sanger had written about marriage and not those about contraception. Afraid that she might be sent to jail without getting a chance to argue for birth control in court, Sanger escaped to England. While she was in Europe, Sanger's husband continued her work, and he was also arrested. New York state law made it illegal to share information about birth control. But Sanger hoped to get around that rule because the law also gave doctors permission to share information about stopping the spread of disease. On October 16, 1916, she opened the Brownsville Clinic in Brooklyn, New York. It was a success, with more than 100 women visiting on the first day. A few days after the clinic opened, an undercover policewoman bought a cervical cap at the clinic and Sanger was arrested. Refusing to walk, Sanger and a co-worker were dragged out of the clinic by police officers. The clinic was shut down, and no other birth control clinics were open in the United States until the 1920s. However, the newspapers wrote about Sanger's trial, and many people thought that what Sanger was doing was a good idea. By the end of 1917, more than 30 new pro-birth control groups had been started in the United States. After Sanger's trial, the birth control movement began to grow. It wasn't just a few radical women in New York anymore. Now, progressive women all over the country were starting to think about how birth control might help women have healthier and better lives. Sanger's organization grew, changed names, and today is called Planned Parenthood. All over the country, Planned Parenthood centers help women learn about birth control options, take care of health problems, and also provide abortions. The birth control movement got an unexpected boost during World War I, when hundreds of soldiers got sick with syphilis and gonorrhea while in Europe. The army tried to teach soldiers how to avoid these sexually transmitted diseases, but their lessons focused on abstinence, and it didn't make much of a difference. Unlike in America, soldiers could buy rubber condoms easily in drugstores in Europe, and this started to limit the spread of STDs. When they came back home after the war, these men wanted to keep using condoms for birth control. The Army's fight against STDs was a big turning point for the birth control movement. It was the first time the government had started a long-term public discussion about something related to sex. Also, it changed birth control from a discussion of what was morally right and wrong to a question of public health. 
Although Sangers and supporters of birth control didn't get rid of the Comstock laws in the early 1900s, their work got things started and made it possible for women's rights group in, groups in the 1960s and 1970s to make birth control, especially birth control pills, a legal and normal part of American life. Let's talk for a moment about a Supreme Court case that can give us some insight into the way people in the Gilded Age thought about the role women should play in American society. At that time, the state of Oregon had passed a law limiting the number of hours women were allowed to work outside the home. Legislators thought that women needed to be protected, especially women who are at an age when they might be having and raising young children. Kurt Muller, the owner of a laundry business, was put on trial for violating the Oregon law. He had made one of his female employees work more than 10 hours in a day. In the case of Muller versus Oregon, the Supreme Court found that Oregon's limit on the working hours of women was constitutional because, the court said, the government had a good reason to protect women who might be raising children. The main question of the Muller case was, if women were equal to men when it came to deciding how much they wanted to work. Oregon law was not meant to hurt women, but in the thinking of the time to protect them, even though it made the law unequal since there were no restrictions on how many hours men were allowed to work. The play case included a few quotes that help us understand the way people in the Gilded Age thought about gender roles. The court wrote, Woman has always been dependent upon man, and in the struggle for subsistence, she is not an equal competitor with her brother. And perhaps most of all, the case showed that Americans were still, that Americans still thought that the most important thing women could do was to have and raise children. The case divided feminists at the time. Some thought the law did protect women and they supported it, but others thought that any law that treated women differently from men was a bad idea. Since the Mueller case, new laws have gotten rid of the restrictions on working hours for women, but women are still not guaranteed equality under the Constitution. Let's finish today's lesson by celebrating and telling the story of the biggest success women achieved during the Gilded Age, winning the right to vote. Women's suffrage, or the right to vote, in the United States happened little by little over many years. At first, some states gave women the right to vote, and finally in 1920, the Constitution was changed to give women everywhere in the country the right to vote. Women first started organizing to ask for suffrage in the 1840s. This was one of the results of the Seneca Falls Convention, the first ever women's rights convention. At the end of the Civil War in 1865, women who had wanted suffrage thought that their time had finally come with the end of slavery there was going to be a change to the Constitution to allow African Americans to vote. But many reformers at the time were afraid that linking women's suffrage to African American suffrage would mean that too many people would reject the 15th Amendment. So the 15th Amendment was passed and the Civil War resulted only in suffrage for men of all races. A step in the right direction to be sure, but still half of all Americans were still outside the political process. The first national suffrage organizations were started in 1869 after the disappointment of the 15th Amendment. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone were leaders of these early organizations. And in 1890, they came together to start the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NAWSA. Many suffragists hoped that the Supreme Court would rule that since the Constitution guaranteed equal protection under the law to all Americans, Women had the right to vote. So suffragists tried to vote in the early 1870s and then filed lawsuits when they were turned away. Susan B. Anthony actually was able to vote in 1872, but was arrested. Unfortunately for the suffragists, the Supreme Court ruled against them in 1875, saying that the Constitution did not imply that women had the equal right to vote. So the suffrage groups began the hard work of adding an amendment to the Constitution that would explicitly give women the right to vote. However, in the beginning, they mostly worked state by state to get each state to give women the right to vote. Progressive reformers in the beginning of the 1900s helped the suffrage movement. Many progressives saw women's suffrage as another progressive goal 
and they thought that if women could vote, it might help them reach some of their other goals. By 1916, the original organizers of the women's suffrage organizations were gone, and a new generation of women took over. Alice Paul started the National Women's Party. Paul thought that women needed to show how unfair things were by taking direct action. More than 200 of her supporters, known as the Silent Sentinels, were arrested in 1917 while marching at the White House. Some of the protesters went on a hunger strike and endured forced feeding after being sent to prison. The larger NAWSA that had been started in the 1800s stuck to a less dramatic strategy under the leadership of Carrie Chapman Catt, but still worked hard to get an amendment to the Constitution passed. There were many Americans who didn't want women to vote. Brewers and distillers opposed women's suffrage. They were afraid that women voters might vote to make alcohol illegal. Many of the new immigrant families were used to paternalistic families in which the husband made decisions for the family about politics. Some other businesses, such as Southern cotton mills, opposed suffrage because they were afraid that women voters would vote to end child labor. Political machines like Tammany Hall in New York City were afraid that female voters would make it harder for them to keep control and stay in power. At the same time Susan B. Anthony and other suffragists were starting their groups, the Women's Anti-Suffrage Association was getting started. Known as the Antis, they were active in 20 states. In 1911, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was started. They claimed to have 350,000 members. The Antis said that women's suffrage would reduce the special protections and routes of influence available to women, destroy the family, and increase the number of socialist-leaning voters. Many upper-class women were against suffrage for women. They were married to or knew many powerful men who were afraid that if all women could vote, they might have less influence. Most often, the antis believed that politics was dirty and that women were naturally pure and should stay out of it. They worried that dividing women between political parties would hurt society overall. Even though there were plenty of people who didn't think women should vote, the movement for suffrage grew especially in the West. Because states manage elections, individual states began passing laws giving women the right to vote. Many Western states, which had just been settled, were just creating their suffrage laws and didn't have a tradition of only men voting. Pioneer women who had walked the trails West and worked under the sun with their husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons were in no mood to take a backseat to them when it came to politics. Eastern states, with hundreds of years of tradition, were slower to change. Paul, Kat, and the leaders of the suffragists finally got Congress to pass an amendment giving women the right to vote. And after fighting to get enough state legislatures to ratify it, the 19th Amendment became part of the Constitution in 1920. It reads, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. When the Founding Fathers were writing the Declaration of Independence, Abigail Adams had written to her husband telling them to remember the ladies in their new government. Sadly, the Founding Fathers did not, and it took another 144 years and the work of thousands of women before both men and women had the right to vote. Let's close out by reviewing our main ideas. During the 1800s, Americans were very conservative about the roles of men and women, and especially about how women could behave and dress. During the Gilded Age, some women began to challenge these ideas. Victoria Woodhull said that women should be able to love whoever they wanted and change their minds as much as they wanted. Margaret Sanger believed that women couldn't be free if they had no control over how many children they would have. Although she wasn't able to change the law at the time, Americans did start to change their mind especially after soldiers learned about birth control during World War I. Women in all the states finally won the right to vote in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Before then, many Western states had already given women the right to vote in state elections. Now that you've made it all the way to the end of this unit, it's time to review. We started by talking about the new immigrants in the growing cities of the Gilded Age, and then spent some time learning about 
how the people of those growing cities work so hard to change America. Make sure that you use the study guide and the Quizlet sets so that there are so many people and changes to keep organized in your mind. Of course, you can watch my review video as well. Good job, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.